social change and community engaged arts projects webinar. Um, my name is Liz Forsberg and I'm a strategy lead here at the Ontario Trillium Foundation. And I'm really, really excited to, to be here today with two colleagues from the University of British Columbia, Annalie Yassi and Patricia Gray, who are going to be sharing um, with us uh, this really exciting online resource that they've developed as part of the um, International Center for Art for Social Changes uh, Shark funded research project. They're going to be answering the questions, how can we evaluate art for social change and community engaged work? Why do we evaluate and for whom? And what approaches and methods can be used? And what ethical issues emerge? So our, our webinar today, um, after some initial slides that I present to you, will begin with a demonstration of the online interactive evaluation tool that, that Dr. Annalie Yassi and her team at UBC developed as part of the Art for Social Change project. And the toolkit is for anyone interested in evaluating an Art for Social Change project, whether an artist, a member of a community organization, a funder, or a researcher. And it aims to uh, clearly explain the concepts, the theories, and practical challenges involved in evaluation while assuming minimal previous knowledge. Users of the tool can follow a step-by-step -step approach to evaluation access examples from across the globe and different art forms, obtain templates of questionnaires, interview guides, and other instruments, get creative ideas, and, and interact with sample scenarios inter introducing a range of complex issues. So just some, some brief instructions for today's webinar. For audio, please call into the meeting um, by dialing the number you see on the screen there, uh, and then enter that PIN code that you see. Uh, during the webinar, all participant phone lines will be muted. And we invite you to enter your questions into the chat window that's located at the bottom right corner of WebEx. So I'm going to be monitoring that chat box. Um, click the drop down box and select everyone to make your entry public, or you can select host presenter if you uh, prefer to send it privately. And the presenter, uh, uh, we, will, we will provide answers to your questions. Um, after the presentation, but if there are some really pressing questions, I, I, uh, I can, um, we can see if we can answer those during the presentation as well. So just really quickly, who we are, the foundation, the Ontario Children's Foundation and what we do, we are an arm's length agency of the government of Ontario. Um, we will be getting a new government in Ontario just uh, a few days away from now. Um, one of Canada's leading grant-making foundations. So we have a budget of over $136 million every year, um, and we, we award grants to around 1,000 projects every year. Uh, we're a leading public agency and partner in the public benefit sector. So we, um, we fund um, in six different action areas, and one of those action areas is named Inspired People. And that's essentially our arts, culture, and heritage granting stream, and we've named that for what we hope to achieve through that stream. Um, this strategy, the funding strategy that we developed, um, has been around for a couple of years now, and it's an outcomes-based strategy. Uh, so it clearly identifies the changes that we want to see through our investments, and those those changes um, are are have, have been. Um, uh, thought through with lots and lots of research done um, leading up to this. So we've identified two priority outcomes that we want to uh, address, better quality programming and infrastructure to experience culture, heritage, and the arts, and more people connecting with culture, heritage, and the arts. And you'll see under those priority outcomes, there are two, uh, there are two grant results under that first one um, and three under the second one. And these are grant results that um, for those of you who have applied to our funding streams before, you'll be very familiar with them. But um, we have always had a very vested interest in community-engaged arts projects. So um, I'm very, very excited today to be um, to be uh, working with uh, Dr. Annalie Yassi and Patricia Gray just to share a really incredible tool um, that, that you can use to evaluate this important work that you're doing. 
So without further ado, I want to present to you um, Dr. Annalie Yassi and Patricia Gray. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read their bios really quickly, and then Annalie is going to be presenting to you first, and I know that she is, I believe she's in Montreal presenting today, and then we're going to turn it over to Patricia, um, who is in BC. So um, Dr. Yassi is a professor in the School of Population and Public Health at the University of, of British Columbia where she holds a, a Tier 1 Canada Research Chair in Global Health and Capacity Building. Uh, she's led several multi-million dollar research and training projects uh, in Canada and worldwide, addressing a wide range of challenges from environmental degradation and infectious disease transmission uh, to impacts of globalization on working conditions. Um, Dr. Yassi was a co-investigator for the last five years on the Art for Social Change project a national research initiative led by Judith Marcuse at the International Center of Art for Social Change. Um, and this resource that she's sharing with you today, I really see as the, the gift of, that that project is, is, is giving to the community engaged arts sector, um, which is very cool. And then our second presenter, Patricia Gray, is uh, uh, an MSc student in population and public health at UBC. And she joined the Art for Social Change Project as a research assistant um, with the evaluation pod in September of 2016. She had previously completed an undergraduate degree in biology and international development studies and a master's degree in business and has worked in fitness, financial services, sustainability, and communications. Um, in addition to studying population and public health, Patricia currently works in communications. So, Without further ado, uh, I am going to be passing the torch over to um, and Dr. Annalie. Uh, the list has already uh, stated why we developed it. I, it's it's uh, really aimed at, uh, as you were saying, everyone, even people who uh, aren't uh, researchers or evaluators or, or, or artists or community workers. But uh, the uh, to just give a basic introduction of what uh, how to go about thinking about the value of arts for social change. The, so there are many ways to use the tool, and we'll demonstrate uh, these ways over the next uh, half an hour or so. The, there, it would be nice to have time to get into debates as to what, what is art and what is social change, but uh, in this kind of setting, it will be a little bit difficult to do that. But do send your comments and questions or any thoughts you have on the tool. As you can see, I'm scrolling past a lot of it. The uh, evaluation itself ranges from really very quick operational process evaluations that we should all be doing all the time to more in-depth studies of what the project is all about, needs to be accomplished, and what it has accomplished. So in this tool, we actually use the words evaluator and researcher somewhat interchangeably. The uh, as you can see here, the evaluation tool is organized to be able to access in different ways. So I'm going to demonstrate a little bit of the evaluation tool, which is the sort of more simple way, as opposed to the evaluation research mini course. We'll go into that a little bit. And then uh, Patricia will demonstrate some scenarios and some examples, and hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for some quiz. The, we organize this into steps for people who really haven't started thinking about this process. Uh, you know, the first step in any kind of evaluation is why are you doing the evaluation in the first place? It should never be an afterthought. The, and what is the theory behind the program? There's the theory of the program, but also the theory of the evaluation itself, of what the project hopes to accomplish. The logic models it can be useful, but we shouldn't be too obsessed with them per se. There's many different art forms, of course, that are used. The, um, the, uh, and who is, you know, initiating the evaluation uh, is really uh, quite important, thinking about all these things, as well as the guiding principles. The, the, before I forget, I wanted to demonstrate the fact that there are other guides out there. This is not the only tool you have available to guide you in your efforts. Here's a list of some of the various ones that are there. They can all be downloaded from this site itself, so you don't have to go searching for them. The, um, once you've focused on the why you're doing the evaluation, the who you're working with is a really key question. You could be, uh, because different parties 
have different perspectives, artists, program participants, facilitators. So knowing who to engage in, your, in, in the evaluation uh, is a very important component and how you're going to engage them. And that will depend to a certain extent on the governance model of your project itself. The, uh, there are tools to evaluate the, the partnership itself. Uh, you may or may not want to hire an evaluator. If you do, there are things to consider uh, in terms of the person's previous experience in the art, in the community, in conducting evaluations and research. And uh, all of these are linked to further aspects within the tool to uh, get more, uh, more details about them. Uh, how can you monitor ongoing progress? Uh, the, uh, it, it's, uh, you should always have regular reports and feedback that's uh, built into your program or your project, whether it's in the form of closing circles at every session or feedback. So again, I'll stress throughout this tool that, that we call it monitoring and evaluation because evaluation isn't something that should only be done at the very end of the process. It should be thought about from the very beginning. What methods you will use in the formal evaluation um, are, are uh, very considerably from arts-based methods uh, to quantitative, to qualitative, to, to mixed methods. The, uh, Trying to decide which ones I had planned to go into here uh, for this. The, uh, um, we'll probably come back to a lot of these in the course of the next half hour. The, the, one of the things I wanted to stress is that not uh, about art based evaluation methods could be used for all sorts of projects, not just arts for social change projects. But similarly, arts for social change projects could use a variety of methods. Uh, and we often think about evaluation as being surveys or focus groups. But you can also use arts as a way uh, of, uh, of uh, you know, evaluating your methods as well. There are certainly some advantages of arts-based evaluation, um, especially if you're using for an arts and social change project. But there's also some difficulties, and I won't take the time to go through the list here. There's uh, challenges as well, and we'll come back to examples of all of these. The, uh, in terms of quantitative methods as well, there are uh, what we call primary data, which is surveys that you create yourself, but you can also access uh, the existing data, what we call secondary data, data that's been uh, collected for other purposes. Uh, it's really important, though, to think about not only when to use these kinds of things, but when not to. And if you don't have a very clear, predefined outcome, or if you, know, you don't want to diminish the intrinsic value of the art by defining these outcomes, um, or if you're more interested in understanding why a program is working than whether it's working, or you have a small target, or it's hard to gather or complete the, 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 the data gathering, then surveys and subsidies methods themselves may really not be the way to go. The, uh, again, there's a myriad of qualitative methods as well that you um, may want to call upon. Uh, these are all things within the tool itself, and uh, perhaps we'll come back to some of these uh, afterwards. So once you decide the method to use, and uh, the, each of these uh, have different techniques to gather the information. Uh, for example, in qualitative methods, there's interviews, observations, focus groups, uh, document review, narrative. Uh, all these are, have basically all the information that you would want for how to do any of these, uh, the pros and cons of unstructured interviews versus semi-structured interviews, uh, how you develop interview guides. So the, the, uh, the tool, again, has uh, lots of these kinds of examples of how you run focus groups, um, how many people is ideal, who should run them, and so on. The, then how you analyze information as well. Uh, the, there's some general principles that should always apply to analyzing any kind of uh, uh, you know, uh, approach. But also, there's, we provide in this tool uh, examples of how, how to go about doing the data analysis in order to, and we've also cited various other uh, sources as well, uh, whether uh, if you're using Likert scales that have these scales of five out of five. And you'll see examples in the tool that, that, uh, of all these different methods as, as we move along. Once you've decided why you're doing this, who you're working with, how you're monitoring throughout, what methods you're using, how to gather the information and analyze it, don't forget to think ahead of how you will share your information, because it's not just text-based information like reports or academic articles, uh, but also 
conferences, policymakers, community town halls. Don't forget about social media, um, various ways to share your results, but also art-based informing and sharing, whether it's through exhibitions, uh, dance performances, murals, and the like. All these, of course, again, have their, their pros and cons. The, uh, before I turn it over to, uh, to Patricia to demonstrate scenarios and examples, there's just a couple of things that I wanted to focus on in particular that are under the, the uh, mini course in particular. Um, one is the issue of ethics. But nothing that we do is, is really ethics neutral, which means we always have to think about, uh, you know, what the issues involved, what harm could possibly be done. Uh, when we did an analysis in the Arts for Social Change project, the International Project, uh, International Center of Arts for Social Change um, five-year project, we uh, categorized the ethical issues in, into three categories. Those related to um, dealing with community university partnerships, including the ethics of meaningful participation. Uh, we know from the start that uh, people don't have a lot of time who are working in communities to uh, devote to evaluation and research. And so the ethics of how to involve the right people without creating power imbalance is always something to think about. Very important for people doing evaluations not to raise false expectations. Uh, make sure that people understand the limits of what you'll be able to answer um, and uh, what you won't be able to answer by this evaluation. The, it's important um, in thinking about issues such as not to stifle creativity, uh, ethics of authorship and ownership, the ethics of dangerous terrain, and asking people about their experiences. You could raise issues uh, that need to be thought about in advance as to how they're, they're going to be addressed. The uh, uh, cycling uh, participation, issues of authorship, who owns the products of the, of, of the arts, and if you're going to use them in evaluation, make sure that you get proper consent. Um, an issue of acknowledgement is that, uh, one that researchers come across a, a lot because especially in dealing with artists who want to take credit for their work, but if, you know, the, uh, some, sometimes we, you know, we offer people anonymity, but we have to sometimes recognize that people don't want anonymity, want, want recognition for their contribution. So there's all these ethical issues are discussed in this, as well as ethics of, of team issues, uh, research, you know, researcher engagement, uh, and so on. Uh, the big issues in academia are just handling interdisciplinarity. But if most of you are community-based, you probably don't think as much about the interdisciplinary component about a lot of these. Uh, the, uh, I wanted to just say a couple of things about uh, context in particular, because really what you're, if you're attempting to have a social change or social transformation, the, you know, you, what that means to you is very much dependent on your ideology, on your theory, on your program theory. And so uh, it, how you go about evaluating depends very much on what it is that you're, you're trying to accomplish. If what you want is personal empowerment, you will ask people a question focused around personal empowerment issues. If what you really are trying to accomplish in your program is social engagement, then you want to organize your program as well as your evaluation along issues of social engagement. If what you want to do is really contribute towards making a better world, then think about how the dynamics of the program and the personal empowerment and the social engagement will lead to, uh, to, to acting on what we call the macro level. So in this tool, we talk a bit about micro, meso, and macro, which macro could be through legislative change, social movement, electoral outcomes, um, and they're not mutually exclusive. We've got various uh, theor theorists quoted throughout this uh, uh, to help us get a, a deeper understanding of the theories involved in, in social change. Uh, the, uh, you know, transformative paradigm. You know, when we talk about context, we wanted to really talk about the importance in any evaluation of really focusing on the power dynamics and the social and cultural context. Uh, it reminds me of one of the evaluations which we were peripherally involved. Uh, the, the, the people running the program were saying the participants don't want to come, that you know, they, it's hard to get volunteers and so on. But really, they were missing the fact that they were dealing in a situation of um, extreme oppression and history of colonization that has to be factored into examining the situation. So the historical and political context uh, matters. 
In dealing with indigenous communities, there's the 4R guidelines of respect, relevance, reciprocity, responsibility. Again, as you can see, there's just a ton of heavy duty issues in, in this tool itself, as well as the more technical uh, aspects. So I think at this point, I'm gonna pass it over to Patricia so we have time at the end for uh, questions, discussion, and quiz. Thank you so much. But it's fascinating, especially when we get into, I mean, the, the tools are incredible and the amount of information that you have um, on the website is, is really, really incredible. And the discussion around ethics and power dynamics is one that I, that I hear a lot, um, especially in a community-engaged context. So I'm really glad um, that there are so many resources there on, your, on this website and, and, and posing really thought-provoking questions. Um, and if questions come up for people who are listening, please do send them, send them our way. Um, Patricia, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you, Liz. Right, so as Emily mentioned, I'll go through the examples as well as the scenarios next. So the examples, which are available through the main menu here or from the top navigation bar, are a collection of published research articles or published evaluation reports that are intended to provide a, a kind of directory of examples that you may want to explore or to help inform or to draw on for your own evaluation planning. We have a series of filters on the left-hand side here that are intended to help uh, find relevant examples for you. And I'll go through two different examples to just show the filtering uh, functionality here. So for example, you may be particularly interested in qualitative methods and may be interested in exploring the outcome of personal development using the art form of drama or theater and, and among a youth population. And so applying those different filters allows you to, to hone in on these three relevant examples uh, that may be helpful for your own evaluation planning. I'll just clear the filters here and show one more example. So similarly, you may be approaching it from a more broad issue, so looking at the issue of aging to begin with, and then thinking of using the art form of music and using art-based evaluation methods. And again, this will let you um, find a relevant example that may be helpful to inform or to help draw on for your own evaluation planning. We're always looking to expand this example section. So if you have any evaluation reports or published research articles uh, that, you're, that you're willing to share with a wider audience, we certainly welcome adding it to this directory of examples. Uh, we have an email address of our colleague, Stephen Barker, at the bottom of this page. Um, and please feel free to send any examples um, that you'd like to be included to the list uh, to Stephen's email at the bottom there. Next, I'll show the scenarios. The scenarios are animated scenarios which are intended to illustrate the concepts that are covered in the evaluation guide and are based on real life scenarios. Uh, we have four different scenarios um, right now in the scenarios uh, collection. I'll go through two of them now. The scenarios also provide a different entry point to the evaluation content. So as we'll see in the two examples of scenarios, they do link back to the respective content areas within that evaluation guide. So they provide uh, both an animated um, interactive format and also a way to access the other content throughout the evaluation guide. Based on the audio configurations for the webinar, I will read the scenarios aloud, uh, but you'll notice when you access the site from your own computer, there's some audio uh, connected to the scenarios. The first scenario that I'll go through is the scenario number one here, responding to a funder's request for evaluation. So in this scenario, a funder requests you submit an evaluation for which you are not prepared. This emphasizes the importance of having a plan for your evaluation from the beginning of your project. You are part of a collective that is running a dance program for urban youth with marginalized lifestyles. Each year, there are about 20 youth who regularly attend the intensive dance program and about 15 others that come and go. The program has been going on for four years and the funder wants you to evaluate your program. What do you do? Initial reaction might be to panic, 
uh, tell the funder that you don't believe in evaluations as the dance program's intrinsic value shouldn't be denigrated by having to be reduced to something that can be evaluated. Call a friend who has a PhD in astrophysics and ask him what to do. Or lastly, have a discussion with the funder so as to understand what indicators are most important to them. Sounds good. And so next, you may be exploring some different ideas with, with the funder in the meeting and some ideas for different techniques based on uh, say a qualitative method that was selected is you may be interested in using focus groups. And so this is where uh, the information will connect back to the content that's available in the evaluation guide. So in this particular instance, you can continue through to learn more about how to conduct focus groups and advantages and disadvantages of that particular uh, technique. Similarly, if you're interested in uh, exploring whether an interview could work for the evaluation, uh, you could connect through to read the particular information about interviews that is available in the evaluation guide. After collecting the information, uh, the next step would be the analysis. And depending on, again, the, the category of method used, it would be different analysis for the quantitative, qualitative, or arts-based uh, methods. And again, these, these boxes link through to the respective information in the evaluation guide. And lastly, following the analysis, um, again, it would be that seven steps in the seven step evaluation guide would be looking at um, how to disseminate the information. Um, and as Emily mentioned before, there's several different ways to, to help share the information. So that was one example of a scenario. I'll just go through, through one more example of a scenario uh, before we move on to the quiz and the discussion. So the next scenario that I'll go through is this third scenario at the bottom here, evaluating an ongoing community-engaged program. And in this scenario, your team carefully drafts an evaluation plan for a long-term project. This video, uh, sorry, this scenario was actually based on uh, research on the social circus program in Quebec, which was conducted by members of the Art for Social Change Research Project. And it includes some video footage from the, from the program itself. Again, based on the audio, I'll read aloud the animated script, uh, but there's also some um, extra video that, um, that you can watch from, from your computers uh, later on as well. It would be good if we could do some research on our program, as Cirque du Monde is cutting its budget for directly supporting a large number of social circus programs, and it would be useful if we could identify what is going well with our program. It would also be useful for us to know what isn't going so well. Yes, I agree. So again, these boxes here just help to um, link through and connect the content uh, with the information that's available in the evaluation guide. I know a researcher who could help us. Great, let's see if she is interested. And again, this is connecting it back to that initial point on the continuum from operational evaluations to more in-depth uh, research. I would love to conduct an in-depth study of your program. I have my certificate in assisting social circus instructing, so perhaps I could do some participant observation and help in the sessions as I learn more about how everything works. That would be great. Is there a way we could actually measure the impact we are having? I think we should supplement the observations that plan to do with in-depth interviews of participants, a focus group, and a questionnaire survey. Sounds good. Let us know how we could help. And again, this is bringing up the, the module on ethics and just some um, ethical considerations um, that Emily had highlighted just previous to this within the mini course and just bringing that into the scenario. Uh, a note on observation and different methods of observation, including participant observation. I've done preliminary analysis based on observing and interviewing some of the participants, and I'm eager to hear what you think about my analysis so far before I proceed. It would be great if we could work together on this, as I'm sure you yourself have considerable insight to share. Yes, we would indeed be interested in discussing our thoughts about the program with you. And again, this is linking back to the, to the point on positionality within research. 
What do you think of using some arts-based methods as well? What do you mean? For example, we can ask some of the participants to take photos of what matters to them and come together and we can discuss these and how these relate to the program. That sounds like a great idea. And these uh, provide some examples of two particular arts-based methods. So in this instance, photo voice and performative inquiry, which were used in the study on social circus. And there's information on the toolkit, which is linked from this page, uh, showing the examples of both photo voice and performative inquiry uh, within this study. And again, showing how they could be used within an evaluation or research uh, setting. Let's keep in mind that we have not really explored how or the extent to which this program is or can be socially transformative. In other words, have impact on changing society, not just having impact on the individuals in the program. Yes, our fundamental goal is indeed to build a better world so that folks like those in this program are truly respected for who they are. Personal and interpersonal transformations, particularly modes of relating to each other, could indeed lead to broader social transformation. Conversely though, social and political transformations shape people's experience at both the individual and collective level. I hadn't thought about this much, but now I can see that when people create together, they feel a sense of community. And this in turn could help them to be more engaged in collective actions that would ultimately make society more fair for all. Yes, and when society puts too much focus on individual achievement, not making things better for all, the vast majority of people lose out. So yes, certainly, let's talk about this more and ensure that the program's pedagogy is indeed promoting solidarity and what we call collectivity, in other words, acting together. Uh, and this links to a video with the researcher, Dr. Jennifer Spiegel, uh, discussing the pedagogy behind the social service program. I will do a preliminary analysis of this material and begin to work on the questionnaire. Who will receive these questionnaires and how will they be administered? It seems like they could take a long time to complete. We pilot tested it and found that it takes about 15 to 20 minutes to do. We also found that there were a few questions that did not seem to have been understood well, so we changed those. And this is just highlighting the importance of pilot testing uh, survey instruments uh, to ensure the questions are appropriate and also the length of the survey questions. I like the fact that the questions ask people to compare how they feel now to how they remember having felt before the program started. And this is a retrospective post pre-design. And again, connecting through to the information in the evaluation guide about that particular uh, survey design. I also like the fact that there are actual numbers so we can attempt to quantify the impact. And this is called a Likert scale. Do we have enough people in our program for it to be worthwhile during a questionnaire? Even if there are only 20 people in the program, it may be worthwhile to do a survey. However, we may not have statistically significant results. And we have some information about Likert scales in the evaluation guide, including several different scales that may be suitable for evaluating art for social change uh, projects. So there's some examples of Likert scales um, in order to provide a questionnaire design. And there's also some information on analyzing uh, quantitative data um, and an explanation of statistical significance. Also, it would be better if we could reach people who were in the program in past years and everyone who registered, even those who didn't finish a session, not just the ones currently in the program. And again, it's just talking about different, uh, different types of bias, including survivor bias, and just highlighting the importance of, if possible, trying to uh, reach participants who may have left the program to capture their experiences within an evaluation. And how should we administer the questionnaire? There are several options. What I suggest is that we bring pizzas or something healthier to one of the sessions and ask the participants to stay late and complete these. Also though, let's send the questionnaire out to those who are no longer in the program and we can use an online questionnaire like SurveyMonkey so people can respond anonymously. And again, just talking about different uh, questionnaire options. So again, the, the 
um, overall the scenarios are meant to illustrate through real life examples, um, different concepts in evaluation and provide some different ideas um, to stimulate some thought around different evaluation methods and different evaluation techniques uh, that could be used. So the quiz section is an interactive quiz that's uh, meant to help test the knowledge from the evaluation guide in the mini course. So we'll just go through a few of the questions in here and feel free to, to weigh in on your responses through the, through the chat box or any particular questions that arise as a result of the quiz questions. The questions have different formats, um, such as true and false or multiple choice. So the first question here is a multiple choice one. Uh, which is the advantages of arts-based methods include the following except address challenges and rebalance traditional power dynamics, easy to analyze and interpret, participants' expression through art may reveal insights that they may not have otherwise articulated, encourage participation of those who may otherwise be reluctant, or the arts can accommodate people who learn in different ways. Unfortunately, I can't see right now the answers that may be coming through the chat box, but you can see here that when you select one of these answers, it's showing which ones uh, may be considered an advantage of our space methods and which one are not an, an advantage. Um, so hopefully just get, um, stimulating some thought around different advantages in our, and of our space methods. And again, at the bottom here, we link through to the content within the evaluation guide. We have one response, uh, number three was the response from one of our uh, attendees. This one here, participants' expression through art may reveal insights that they may not have otherwise articulated. Yes. Yes, yeah, and, and seeing that as an advantage for our space methods. Yeah. 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 Any other questions or, or comments on this one? Um, we have um, from Annalie, all of all these are advantages except for number two. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, and that's one of the challenges that we highlight earlier in the toolkit within the arts based methods section is something to consider. Like any uh, method, um, they have different challenges, and one one with arts based method being that it can be it can be challenging to analyze and interpret. Um, uh, data collected through our space methods. Just a, just a quick note, I think um, I just got a, a message here from somebody. I just want to clarify that this is not a, an interactive quiz that you can actually do on the webinar, but we're asking people, so if, you, if you're if you not uh, crazy, if you are unable to figure out how to do it, but you can respond to the questions in the chat box and I'll share those. Yes, yeah, thank you for clarifying that, Liz. Well, just move to the next question here. It's a true-false question. So if you are an academic, uh, should you wait for a response from peer reviews before sharing a synthesis of your findings with your community partners and participants? True or false? I see a vote for true. You see here, true. So we actually think, I mean, this is an interesting point to discuss. We actually think that the input of the community partners and participants may may it may make the work better, and so may not need to wait for the long period of peer review. Um, however, if you are sharing preliminary results, you should advise um, your partners that, that it is at this stage a preliminary report and therefore subject to modification and finalization after peer review. Emily and Patricia, we had a question come up that relates to um, the last um, quiz question that you put out there. Could I could I put that out there to both of you now? Sure. So this question was: Can the conclusions drawn from arts-based methods perhaps be biased? Um. Do you want? To Did you want to take that one, Emily? Sure. Uh, yeah. Um, are you hearing? Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, uh, th there's really no such thing as as lack of bias because even in questionnaires, 
how you frame the questions, what questions that you, that you put to people is itself a bias. If you want to ask people about social inclusion, you're giving them, you're biasing to say social inclusion is what matters and that's more important than personal growth or social engagement. So it's, it, there's no such thing as a method that's not biased. But we try to recommend multi-methods as much as possible because every single method has advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the, uh, but one of the things I like about photo voice is when we ask people what does the program mean to them or what's important in their life, it's giving people very little bias. Uh, when you're interviewing people or writing questionnaires, you're providing a lot more bias than when you just leave it open-ended for someone to express themselves. Great, thanks for, thanks for addressing that one. Really, really important to remember that um, as you go through the process of, of creating your evaluation that we all bring bias with us. So, um, Patricia, are you continuing the quiz? Yes, yeah, I can move along here to the next. So this is just showing the different, again, the different kind of uh, modes for the quiz question. This one here has a drag and drop. Um, interface that um, that asks you to match up the different evaluation methods and techniques uh, with what you hope to accomplish. So again, coming back to that first point in the first step of the evaluation guide about thinking initially about the program theory and how that aligns with the particular evaluation methods um, that could that could be used. Um, and so this allows you to drag and drop the different um, methods to it. Um, so for example, if you're looking to investigate the skills needed to effectively advocate for better daycare policy and engage in, with single mothers to improve these skills, um, what type of methods uh, do you think would be appropriate uh, for that particular program? So the options that we have across the top are quantitative methods, participatory action methods, discourse analysis, or interviews. I got one response, participatory. Let's try it out. There we go, yes. Yeah. So looking at participatory action uh, mothers and, and really tapping into that, that the goal to, to um, advocate and engage uh, with the participants. So again, you can match up the different, um, the different um, program theories and, um, and evaluation techniques for this particular quiz question. Moving to the next one, another true and false. So true or false, you only need to consider ethics if you're submitting a research ethics board application at a university. True or false? Uh, a true with a question mark, a couple of falses. <laughs> this one is like Interesting. a true question. <laughs> yeah. Let's try the, the, the first vote for true, let's see. So while only formal research studies, and again, this is thinking about that uh, right-hand side of the, of the re evaluation to research continuum, the more kind of traditional university-based uh, research studies are submitted to a formal research ethics board for review. It is always useful to consider ethical issues even in process evaluation, so even at the other end of the continuum. And um, again, as Emily went through in the, in the mini course, there are some different categories of ethical issues that were highlighted there that can be helpful to, to frame and consider different ethical issues that, that may arise through an evaluation. Are there any other general questions or comments at this point? Yes, we do have a question, um, a general question that came earlier on. Um, artists and arts organizations do so many things and are always stretched in terms of capacity. How would you advise folks about when to invest time, energy, resources in doing evaluation, or conversely, when it might not be a worthwhile investment? Uh, can I comment? Yes, please. Yeah, the, it's, 
I think that if you're serious about wanting to have a, your program to have an outcome that, you know, whether it's for the individuals involved or for the community or for your funders, that it's useful to think about how you're going to monitor your, how, how, whether you're achieving your goals from the very beginning, from the very, very time that you set up your program. Now, some of the monitoring techniques are very easy. It's just, uh, uh, you know, five minutes at the end of the session, ask people how, how the session went for them. So I think that uh, in one of the other scenarios, actually, that Patricia didn't have time to demonstrate, uh, we, we show how you can be evaluating throughout as part of your process. So what we want people to do is to think about what they're trying to achieve as part of the entire program, not as an add-on. In, in, you know, in terms of whether or not you want to study it in depth, the example of, with, of social circuits is at one extreme. That's at the extreme right. There was a funded study uh, that was a research project. But at the other end are things that people do all the time anyways within their program. So where you are in the continuum will depend a little bit on how much, you know, it, the, you want to spend really thinking about what you're doing. But we'd like to encourage people to, to do this as being just part of their thinking about how they're administering their program. Did that help? Yeah, that's great. I, I um, thank you from the person who asked the question. <laughs> It's something um, at, at the foundation, um, we really, really encourage people um, to, um, uh, to invest in evaluation of their programs. Um, and in fact, in, in our granting streams, um, we, we invite people to, to assign up to 10% of their overall budget towards, towards evaluation so that they can build a body of evidence around the effectiveness of the approach that they're taking in their, in their projects. But certainly um, we know arts organizations are very stretched, uh, but I think that sometimes people are doing more evaluation than, they're actually, they, than they actually think they're doing. <laughs> they have incorporated things. Exactly. Um, and it's just a matter of taking, taking a moment to, to really um, I guess think about what it is that you've been doing and, and being intentional about it. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. Do we have any other questions from, uh, from uh, attendees on the phone? You can type your questions into the chat box and, um, and I will share your questions with Annalie and Patricia. Um, and while people might be doing that, I'm actually going to um, actually, Patricia, did you did you have any more screens that yes. you wanted to share? Yes. We can certainly keep going, but I think if if, if anyone has any general uh, questions, um, we can we can move on to the general discussion, or we can keep going through the quiz. Keep going through the quiz. Yeah. Okay. That will that will raise issues. Okay, so the next question that we have here, um, this is a situation-based question. You received the results of an evaluation of a similar program to one you recently evaluated but in a different community. It used the same art form, the same age group, and the same evaluation method, but the results are different. You, option one, go back and check your analysis for mistakes. Two, decide that the other evaluation must be incorrect. Or three, consider the different context of the program. If you want to vote through the chat box, you can indicate choice one, two, or three. So you vote for three. Another vote for three. For three, yeah. Okay, let's go with that one. And that is, that is correct. So it's really important to consider the context as it can influence the underlying program theory, the evaluation analysis, and results, as well as the interpretation of the results, among other factors. And again, that connects back to the information about uh, about context, which is in the mini course. We do have a, a question face here because it is also, it can also be always um, a useful exercise to go back and check your analysis for mistakes. So that's not necessarily incorrect, uh, but, uh, but really the key consideration here is uh, considering the different contexts of the program. I'll just pass it over to Annalie here. 
Uh, no, that's okay. I, I, I think you should go to the quiz more because it will raise more issues. But I was thinking more about the question that the other questioner asked about, you know, people are so stressed, do they have time for, for thinking about all of this? And uh, the evaluation shouldn't be this bugaboo, this add-on, this, this extra task. It should be just a, a way we get people to think about what they're trying to accomplish. The most important part of evaluation is think about the program theory. Think about what it is you're trying to do. How you, what would make you feel that you've accomplished it at the end? And everything else is just the techniques for doing that. So maybe just continue on the quiz and we'll see what questions arise. Okay. So the next one, you want to study how the Art for Social Change project is currently being perceived amongst the 18 individuals in the program. Your evaluation could, one, have a focus group using arts-based methods in the facilitation. Two, administer a survey using a validated scale for self-esteem, social inclusion, and social engagement. Or three, conduct interviews. So again, this is coming back to the different, um, based on the on the um, intention for the, and the theory behind the evaluation of which methods. And I think a key word here is the, is the word perception in here. You're wanting to evaluate how the program is being perceived amongst the individuals. So are there any votes for the particular methods, focus group, survey, or interviews? See a vote for three interviews. Yes, uh, yeah, and there's actually there's a bit of a trick because there's two answers here. So either the focus group or the interviews. But really, when thinking about trying to capture individuals' perceptions, the qualitative analysis would probably be the best fit. So again, that could be done through focus groups or through uh, the, through the interviews. And again, another point here, because you're only considering the current perception and not how perception is changing over time, you would not need to collect multiple data points. Therefore, conducting interviews or holding a focus group for cross-sectional qualitative analysis would be best. And to the next question here, so another scenario. As part of an evaluation of a youth arts program, you analyzed a video recorded skit created and performed by the participants illustrating their experiences during the program. After reading the evaluation findings in a report, a few of the participants dispute the findings, saying that your interpretation of the skit does not reflect their true thoughts and feelings. What could have been done to mitigate this issue? One, not use the video recording of the skit in the evaluation. Two, use the survey of the participants instead of the video. Or three, brought preliminary results back to participants for feedback before finalizing the findings. I see a vote for three. Number three, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this is one I think we talked about earlier going through the guide is our space evaluation methods have many advantages, including the opportunity for participants to express themselves through different art forms. However, misrepresentation of art can, be, can easily happen, so it's important to consider ways to mitigate this issue. And one way can be to bring the preliminary results back to participants uh, for feedback. Any other general thoughts or questions that have arisen uh, through the chat box in the meantime? I don't have any other general questions in the chat box. No. We had one more quiz question to, to cover here. Great. So maybe I'll just finish this, finish this question, then we can open it up to some more general questions and also conscious of the time here. So the, this quiz question is, what do you do if the data you collect with different methods give contradicting messages? For example, the quantitative results show no gain, but the qualitative results suggest there are benefits for some participants. So one, throw out the survey results. Two, ignore the difference and report both. Three, consider the qualitative information too anecdotal and discard it. Or three, or sorry, four, explore possible explanations as to why the data differs. I've got one person answering this four. 
Four? Yeah. Vote for four? Let's take a look here. Yes, that is correct. Yeah. So often surveys do not have enough power to detect important impacts because the numbers are not large enough. Also, the fact that some people may benefit even if the majority do not is still worth noting. Um, and so, yeah, just emphasizing the idea of, um, of looking, especially when using mixed methods, of looking at triangulating and comparing the data that you may get from different methods. All right, those are such great quiz questions, and you learned so much going through those um, different scenarios there. Thank you, Patricia. So, um, I, I, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, the, um, we could go through more of the questions. We could just leave this for participants to go on their own. We have, a, there's 30-some questions uh, in, in the quiz, and they all relate back to different parts of, of the tool itself. Uh, for the most part, we've been demonstrating this tool to people who are already deeply engaged in evaluation or even research. And so your audience is probably more at the, uh, the community level, people who are doing the project and uh, may still feel daunted by the whole idea of evaluation. So we'd be really interested in knowing uh, whether parts of this tool are, um, are useful enough to allay their concerns and make this uh, the exercise of evaluation much more fluid and part of their thinking rather than an add-on burden. So if anyone has any thoughts as to uh, both in terms of improving the tool or just letting us know, uh, because I think it's really a shame for people to think of evaluation as being a burden rather than something that will enhance um, feeling good about what they're doing. Absolutely. So, yeah, I welcome I welcome um, our our attendees to um, shoot their feedback by the chat box. Um, I'm about to share a screen with you that um, gives you the the address for OTS New Knowledge Center, which is um, an uh, an online shared learning environment that aims to connect Ontario's nonprofit sector. And I host an Inspired People Hub on the Knowledge Center. Um, and what I posted a thread on the Knowledge Center um, as a, as a follow-up to this webinar where I would welcome people to come and, and share their thoughts about, um, about this evaluation tool. And as Annalie put the question out there, is this, how, is this tool going to help you in, in the, the community-based work that, that you're doing? Um, is, it, is it helping you to, um, to overcome any kind of anxieties that you might have about evaluation? Because I know from talking to many community groups that there's a lot of trepidation um, about that. And um, uh, we're hoping that all of these resources that um, that we've been sharing this, in this webinar and, and two others that we hosted with Animating Democracy um, that, uh, that aim to, to, to share some really, really great tools and resources around evaluation. Um, I have one response here. Um, let me see. I, I have a few responses here. Um, so one person, I think a lot of the challenges are around language, uh, around outputs, outcomes, and impacts. And, also, how to devise these outcomes. Um, from somebody else, this is a very honest response. Um, it's not helping me, it's making me more anxious. <laughs> huh. um, and another response is that this tool will definitely help with our community-based evaluation. It will also really support the grant writing stage as well. See, um, if I can jump in to the person who, uh, you know, feel anxious about it. Uh, we went really, really, really quickly. Uh, the I think if you um, if you slow the process down and just go through the, the seven steps, you'll see that you have all the answers. The uh, and if you don't know the answers, then it's good to think about it. I, there was one project I was involved with, and I asked the person running it, who's the target population for this project, and she said, Oh, I hadn't thought about that before. And I'm thinking, well, you know, if asking the question is probably a good, it was probably a good way for her to start thinking about who, who is the population she aims to serve with this arts-based project of hers. Um, so I think that it's, that all evaluation, in fact, all research is, is 
getting a systematic approach to your thinking about what it is that you're doing and what would make you feel that you're, what you're doing is useful, that you feel good about. And everything else is just fancy, sophisticated, you know, gobbledygook language to do what you already know. So, uh, you know, I, I, if you have specific questions and want to just, you know, email me or chat with me, uh, I, I'd be delighted to do so. Because uh, our goal is to make this less of a burden and make you less anxious. We just don't know how to do that. Thanks. Thanks for that, Emily. And I think there's somebody here who I just um, who messaged me um, that they had typed some questions and didn't get responses. And I just looked for those questions. I couldn't find them. So if you can try again, shoot those questions my way. And we still have um, Emily and Patricia um, with us. Um, and if you don't have time to do that, um, I want to um, invite people to go to the Knowledge Centre. You'll see finally this, uh, we've overcome our technological issue here, which is me fumbling over um, this uh, technology here. Um, we will, if you have any questions, comments, um, please go to the Inspired People Hub on the Knowledge Centre, so it's otf.ca slash knowledge. And you can, um, you can put your questions, your comments there, and I will make sure that, um, that Annalie and Patricia um, get those questions and we can get you um, responses to that. Yeah, I, I want to comment on the logic framework analysis question, the uh, impact outputs outcomes question, if I may. Uh, uh, that's used, of course, not just with our space projects, but internationally for community-based projects or, uh, or uh, development projects. Uh, the wording, I think, is more scary than the concepts behind it. Uh, the, uh, your activities is just what you're doing. Your output is what you hope to, the activities are going to result in. For example, uh, if you're, uh, you know, and I do a lot of training things, so if your, your, uh, your activity is to provide a training course, your output is 20 people trained, uh, the, out, the outcome is better trained people able to do their job better, and the impact is a better world. You know, so the, the impact aspect of that is really your long-term aspirations, and the difference between output and outcome is simply the output is something that you can count, it's process-wise, you know, yes, we held four sessions, or, you know, yes, you know, 20 people came to our event, uh, or whatever. And, and the outcome is just the intermediate thing between your output and your aspiration of, you know, what, uh, how, what, what, you know, how did this help? How did it, what was, you know, are people now better trained, more aware? Are they better able to connect to each other? Do they have more confidence in their abilities as people or whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish with your art space method, with your, your project? So again, the words are more daunting than the actual, um, you know, thinking about it. If anyone sat down with you and interviewed you about what you're trying to accomplish, I'm sure they'd be able to pull out of you your activities, your inputs, your uh, outputs, and your outcomes and your impacts. Thank you for that, Annalie. And if there are any more questions, please do send them, uh, send them our way. I'm just seeing some comments of gratitude. Um, we are very, very grateful that you've taken the time on this nice, sunny day to, to join us. Um, again, please, please do check out our, our Knowledge Center. Um, I'll also just note that we have, um, OTS has developed uh, an online um, e-learning course on evaluation. That is another resource. Um, I will say it is not nearly as thorough as um, this, the, the ASD evaluation tool. Uh, but nonetheless, it's, um, it's done in a, in a course format, so that, that might be something that, um, that might work well for some people. Um, if there are no more questions, um, then I, I think that we're going to end a couple of minutes early. Um, Annalie and Patricia, I want to thank you so, so much for um, presenting, um, presenting the ASC evaluation tool today. You've done a really, really incredible job at putting together a comprehensive tool that I think is really going to benefit the, the art sector um, and beyond for many years to come. So thank you for all your work. And I will say um, 
this is the, the first SHRP research project I am aware of that has kind of produced such a big gift back to the community that it was researching with. So, so thank you for that. That's very ethical of you. <laughs> yes, well, thank you very much for those kind comments. And please, people, do send us feedback. Wonderful. Okay, well, everybody have a wonderful afternoon, and this webinar was recorded, um, and we will send that to you once we've got it all edited. Um, you'll also receive a, a message from us with a link to the Knowledge Center, and uh, I look forward to staying in touch. Thanks very much. Okay, bye-bye.